Welcome, everybody. I'm Paolo Cassano. This is the MGH Brain BPM round. So today is 12 15, uh, 2023. And it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Natalia Arias, a professor at the University of uh, Navica in Madrid, Spain, and uh, um, Dr. Matteo Martini, Assistant Professor at the University of Foggia, Italy. They will present uh, on uh, uh, neuroenhancement with uh, photobiomodulation. Um, thank you both for um, being here and take it away. <laughs> okay, I'll share presentation then. Can you all see it? Yeah. We can. Okay, great. All right then. Um, hello everyone. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure to be invited by by you, Paolo. Thanks again for the invitation. As you can see from the title of um, of our presentation today, we're gonna present the results of a simple behavioral study. I will call it. Uh, about the possibility to use a uh, F uh, nearest device uh, that is functional near infrared uh, spectroscopy devices as possible PBM uh, inducers, PBM factor inducers. Before introducing you to the um, results of the of this study, I'd like to uh, I'd like to talk you through um, some bits of uh, history about this uh, technique of uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy in case you're not uh, familiar with it, and then uh, um, through some nuts and bolts uh, of its uh, uh, functioning uh, principles. So let's start with uh, a little bit of uh, history first. The development of uh, optical methods started in the 40s with uh, muscle oximeters and was therefore intended to provide measures of uh, tissue oxygenation. And then in uh, 1977, Franz uh, Jobsis at Duke University <clears throat> published this study in uh, science where he basically uh, found out that uh, the high level of uh, brain tissue transparency enabled uh, to, to near light, to near infrared light, enabled uh, um, real-time non-invasive uh, measurement of uh, hemoglobin oxygenation of the of the brain. Um, and, and he did this via transillumination uh, spectroscopy. Um, his discovery allowed uh, him and uh, his uh, colleagues to um, uh, carry out uh, research on uh, the brains of uh, sick newborns to study the metabolic activity of uh, of the brains of these um, of these kids. Uh, in 1980, um, uh, Marco Ferrari at the Istituto Superiore uh, di Sanità in uh, Rome uh, came up with a patent pointing out the relevance of a simultaneous mapping uh, of different uh, cortical. Uh, brain areas, but uh, we had to wait until until uh, 1993 uh, to see the first uh, actual uh, simultaneous recording of different cortical brain areas, and this was done by Hoshi and Tamura. These Japanese guys in uh, Japan run this uh, study using five different uh, single-channel devices, so still we didn't have at that time a multi a multi channel uh, device and they um, run this uh, research on um, on participants while they're performing different mental tasks as well as uh, uh, different sensory stimulation like uh, auditory and, and uh, visual stimuli back a few years from that date uh, we have the first commercial system which was built in uh, 1989 by Hamamatsu Photonics, a Japanese um, company, as you can uh, guess. They uh, came up with uh, this Nairo 1000, which was a single channel uh, continuous wave uh, device. 
Nowadays, as you can see, we have uh, different uh, FNIRS devices. They can different terms of uh, montages in terms of the caps, uh, the material of the caps, and also they can different terms of the portability. So, for instance, we can have uh, um, the uh, octodes arranged place uh, around the foreheads of the participants, and therefore measuring the prefrontal cortex uh, activity rather than uh, uh, having the, the probes uh, uh, covering the, the whole scalp or parts of it. Here you can see like a temporal parietal occipital uh, montage in the middle um, in the middle figure. And on uh, the top right, you can see a fully portable uh, device. We have also different um, uh, different systems in, in terms of, uh, as I said, uh, the, the caps used because we can have devices which make use of a simple um, uh, system of uh, Velcro straps rather than uh, neoprene uh, materials or uh, elastic bands. But how do these uh, devices work? Uh, well, they are based on the principle that most uh, uh, um, most of the biological uh, tissues are um, semi-transparent to near-infrared light. And um, this is, uh, is true for human bodies as well and, and for the uh, human heads as well. The good thing is that uh, uh, though the uh, hemoglobin acts as a chromophore, so as a light uh, absorber. And here you can see plotted the absorption spectra of oxy uh, in red and uh, the oxy in blue hemoglobin. So the molar extinction coefficients, uh, you, I don't know how familiar you, you are with this stuff. I guess you are, but uh, in case you, you're you not, uh, the molar extinction coefficients uh, um, provide a measure of uh, how uh, strong a sample absorbs light at different wavelengths. And um, here you can see that there's a sort of uh, the two overlaps until uh, say 560 uh, around, Six, uh, uh, 600 um, nanometers in terms of wavelengths. And um, actually most of the commercially available FNIR system use this uh, wide range between 680 and, uh, and 850. And this is done to maximize the separation between uh, these two uh, parameter because the difference between this, this two allows the calculation of the uh, respective concentration of uh, both uh, oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. And we will see this better now. Um, so I uh, said that the hemoglobin act as a chromophore, a light absorber. And uh, so when this near light is projected into the head, it is either scattered by the different tissue layers or absorbed by uh, mainly absorbed by um, the uh, hemoglobin when the light uh, uh, crosses some blood vessels. So uh, the concentration level, as I was saying, can be uh, calculated uh, um, taking in uh, consideration the absorption variations and the extinction, extinction coefficients using the so-called uh, Beer-Lambert law, otherwise known as Beer's law which basically states that uh, the absorbance is, a, as you can see, a very simple equation, that the absorbance is uh, equal to the uh, absorptivity uh, multiplied by uh, path length and, and concentration um, of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the sample. So in this way, we can, if we know the other, uh, the other indices, we can calculate the uh, concentration levels of the uh, two parameters that we want to that we want to know, oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. But to make this uh, uh, beer law, um, so to make this uh, law of physics uh, something useful uh, for neuroscience, we need to take an extra step and uh, refer to another principle, which is the principle of neurovascular uh, coupling which uh, basically states that the changes in uh, neural activity yes, are... Recognition, recognition. Sorry? So, the, 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 so not only you measure? So I cannot hear you very No, well. I think uh, someone was uh, um, unmuted, uh, but um, oh, okay. everything should be fine. 
Okay, all right. So as I was saying, uh, the principle of uh, neurovascular coupling states that basically um, changes in neural activity are associated with changes in the cerebral blood flow. So at uh, a higher uh, neural activity will, um, will follow a, a higher uh, regional cerebral blood flow for an arterial uh, vasodilation. And so we will have more blood supply. So in other words, a brain area which is more active uh, will receive more uh, blood supply. And when we use uh, uh, our uh, nearest devices, we can uh, um, we can measure the um, average uh, hemoglobin oxygen uh, saturation levels and therefore have an index of uh, uh, cerebral uh, activity. This is just one of the many, many, many studies published using this uh, this technique. Um, I'd like to refer to, to this as a, uh, I'm showing something uh, traditional here in a sense that uh, this is uh, how uh, FNIRS devices are traditionally uh, used. Uh, we hope with Natalia that uh, in the future uh, we tra the yeah uh, traditional FNIRS devices can be used in in, in other ways uh, as well. But um, so far um, here is the uh, the traditional use. So this study was by Kang and co-workers was published in Brain Sciences this year, as you can see. And if you look at the bottom image, uh, you can see that um, these guys had two uh, groups of, um, of participants, not patients, just uh, one was, uh, was a, a group of uh, patients. The, the patients were affected by major depressive symptoms, and the other group was uh, a group of uh, um, age-matched uh, um, elderly, uh, healthy adults. So as you can see, again, from the uh, bottom image, what they found and what you usually uh, want to uh, find out uh, with uh, your FNIRS uh, device is a uh, significant difference in terms of uh, uh, metabolic activity. Uh, in this case, uh, the depressive symptom group reported a significantly lower prefrontal cortex uh, activity compared to the normal group uh, when they were performing a Stroop test. So again, just uh, a, uh, an example. But let's steer now uh, the conversation towards uh, something that we're all interested in, that is uh, photobiomodulation. So I... Um, talked about how uh, the hemoglobin acts as a chromophore, that is a light absorber. And the main feature of the chromophores is their photon energy absorption. And actually, uh, PPM is uh, thought to be um, related, strictly related to the, as you all know, to the photon energy uh, absorption and upregulation of the cytochrome C oxidase, a, um, um, a, an enzyme present in the inner membrane of uh, mitochondria, which is essential for cellular uh, metabolism. Um, the near light, when it comes in, it would interact with the cytochrome C oxidase by restoring the electron uh, transport, uh, transport chain activity. And uh, therefore, there would be a, um, an increase, a uh, yeah, uh, a better uh, cellular metabolism, also an increased uh, um, uh, production of uh, ATP. Um, these uh, cellular uh, um, mechanisms will translate uh, into a uh, modulation of the overall uh, neural activity, at least in the uh, areas of the brain which are stimulated by the, the light, the near light. And um, this change in, uh, uh, in the neural activity would also lead most of the times, not always, but uh, often uh, it would uh, um, mean uh, a, a better cognitive activity. And this has been uh, uh, shown in uh, many, many studies, an increasing number of uh, evidence is, uh, is present in the literature. I would just re uh, revise a very few uh, here. So PBM has been shown, for instance, to uh, possibly um, attenuate the detrimental effects of uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries. 
and uh, also um, it has been shown to uh, counteract the detrimental effects of normal aging associated with no normal aging. Um, has been shown to improve cognition in patients with dementia and in an animal model of hepatic encephalopathy uh, to increase uh, memory. But um, as you all know, this is not, uh, these uh, beneficial effects of PBM have not been documented only in patients, but also in healthy participants. Uh, and uh, this was documented in uh, uh, a, uh, a series of uh, uh, different cognitive uh, domains, like for instance, uh, attention and short memory. Many of these are obviously related, uh, rule-based uh, category learning, uh, visual search and processing speed, working memory, um, and in general, attentional capabilities and executive functioning. So we can uh, now get to uh, uh, the point uh, where we can introduce our our study, starting from the rationale. So Natalia and I have published this uh, commentary a couple of years ago in the Journal of Integrative uh, Neuroscience uh, uh, to basically point out that despite the increasing amount of evidence uh, showing how PBM can be, or should I call it PNM, uh, um, despite the, the increasing amount of evidence, as I was saying, uh, in favor of a beneficial effect of PBM uh, in, um, in the brain uh, and for the cognitive uh, um, activity, uh, FNIR studies have so far completely ignored the possibility that uh, uh, they could be inducing an effect uh, just by using their devices. Because I remind you, uh, these devices are based on the projection on, of uh, near light. So we thought it was important to uh, find out whether the usage of, of a traditional uh, FNIRS device could just by itself induce an effect in the participants. Why? Because there are thousands of studies uh, using FNIRS, and many of them um, have uh, the aim of um, assessing the efficacy of um, efficacy of uh, of a treatment, um, whether this is a uh, I don't know um, a brain stimulation or a specific cognitive the cognitive activity rather than a, I don't know physical physical activity and so on. So it is essential, and we come to the research question now to know, as I said, to understand, to investigate whether the traditional, uh, the use of a traditional FNIRS device can lead to a modulation in the neural activity, in our case, uh, case uh, indexed by a modulation in the uh, cognitive performance of our participants. So specifically, we wanted to see whether there was a, an improvement in the, um, in the um, performance of our participants. So we come to the design here. Um, our design was kind of uh, simple, was a single blinded cross-sectional two by two mixed ANOVA design with two factors, one uh, between subjects factor. We had an experimental group and a control group and a within participants uh, factor. That is, we had a pre and a post sessions where, um, during which our participants uh, were asked to perform at three different uh, cognitive tasks. After the pre-session, uh, both groups of participants were fitted with the uh, FNIRS device, but as you can see from the image, uh, only the, the only difference between the two groups was that um, only the experimental group had the device turned on while the control group uh, was led to think that uh, the device was on, but in, uh, in fact, it was not, it was off. During this phase, uh, we had a, uh, uh, a time of uh, stimulation, uh, stimulation time of eight minutes, and this was adopted uh, from another PBM study, the one by Barrett and Gonzalez Lima, uh, 2013. And after the stimulation, um, the uh, FNIRS device was kept on during the post phase. So the participants were asked to uh, do again the three um, cognitive tasks. 
with the device on for the experimental group while the quantical group had, again, the uh, device uh, turned off. Um, this is just a, yeah, to overlook the, to, to get a, a look at the uh, apparatus, uh, the specific apparatus that we uh, used. Uh, we use the Spectrotech OEG-16, uh, um, the, this Japanese company, the Spectrotech, uh, now recently, uh, they came out with the, the a newer version, a 617, sorry, H, um, but the arrangement of the of the optodes is uh, is different and is uh, more localized uh, on the parietal on the back of the head, in the parietal um, areas. Ours, as you can see, um, have the the, the probes uh, all along the the foreheads of the participants, so uh, they are meant to measure the uh, prefrontal cortex uh, activity from the middle image. You can see that. Um, uh, once you um, put the, the scalp on, on top of uh, the, this um, array of probes on top of the participant's head with a um, simple system of uh, Velcro straps, uh, um, this uh, um, company provides you with a, a, an extra uh, rubber band to be applied on top of, uh, of, the, uh, of the optodes to make sure that they stick to the participant, uh, to the participant head, to the participant forehead. Um, and this is uh, kind of uh, uh, good because you can see from uh, the um, calibration phase, uh, because you have the possibility to uh, to actually check the calibration, you can check whether there is a good signal or not. And in our case, this meant, uh, uh, well, at least we, we think uh, it meant that we were actually stimulating the uh, the brain. From the right image, you can see there are six uh, light emitting probes in this unit. Um, these lead together with the, the other six uh, light uh, receiver probes. Uh, this meant that we had a 16 recording channel, but uh, no actual recording was ever, uh, was ever done because uh, it didn't make sense. Why it didn't make sense? Because we only uh, had one uh, of the two group with the device on. Um, to finish with the slide, uh, the wavelengths of uh, these uh, spectral OEG16H are 770 and 840 nanometers with an output power of 5 milliwatts. This is to show you the, the, the actual montage. Um, in, uh, so if you look at the um, left, uh, on the left hand side, you have the, the montage and uh, um, in light blue, you can see the position of the light emitting parts. In uh, green, uh, the position of the light receiving parts. And uh, in uh, uh, pink, you have the position of the measurement uh, channels. In our case, uh, the pink ones corresponded to the uh, points we were uh, stimulating. Um, we followed the uh, international 10th 20 system to mount this uh, this cap on, on the participants' um, foreheads uh, with the FBZ as a point of reference for the center of the of the array of uh, of the probes, and the areas covered according to the literature corresponded to the inferior parts of the superior frontal gyrus, uh, the parts uh, triangularis in uh, obviously we're talking bilaterally of the inferior uh, frontal gyrus and the um, bilateral middle frontal gyrus, which um, corresponds to the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, the uh, cognitive tests. Um, I told you that we used uh, three different cognitive tests uh, to assess a, a range of uh, cognitive functions. So we had a, a backward counting task delayed match to sample task and uh, an East troop task. Uh, the order of these uh, tests was uh, randomized in both rounds. Uh, obviously, we provided instructions to our participants as well as the opportunity to ask for any, any questions. And the instructions contained an instruction to uh, be as accurate and as fast as possible. And this was uh, stressed 
during both rounds, obviously stressed uh, in, in both, uh, for both um, uh, groups of uh, participants. Now, before I pass the ball to Natalia, just quickly uh, going through each one of uh, these uh, cognitive tests, starting with the backward counting task. Uh, probably all of you know uh, very well this very simple uh, task, but in, in case some of you uh, don't, it consists in asking your participant to count backward from a given number and then subtracting uh, a fixed amount uh, each time, like it uh, can be three, five, or, or seven. In our case, participants were asked to count backward uh, from 112 in sets of uh, seven. Measures taken were time to completion. So um, from the time the participants said uh, 112, uh, till uh, they said zero and the number of errors. So in case of an error, the uh, experimenter provided the correct uh, number so that the participant could um, take it back from, uh, from there. Uh, this task is considered to be a measure of uh, concentration and information processing speed. And the rationale for using this task was that uh, um, the um, mental arithmetics and the serial subtractions, like in this case, uh, are um, thought to activate the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which uh, is an area, as I said, uh, that we were uh, stimulating. Um, the delayed match to a sample task, this was a task that uh, required the use of a, of a laptop, this one and uh, the East group. Um, basically, in this task, you're showing your participants with a, um, a four by four grid of blue and yellow uh, squares uh, arranged um, in a randomly, so in a random way. Uh, this can vary between seven and, and nine blue squares, with the rest uh, being yellow. So the test starts with a presentation for five seconds of a, a target stimulus, like the one you can see on the top uh, right corner. Then this target stimulus disappears for uh, four seconds. And after this, uh, uh, two um, configurations, two patterns are presented, uh, like uh, you can see in the uh, right middle figure. Uh, two stimuli are presented, and the participant is asked to basically click on the on the right one on what they think was the previous uh, previously shown uh, um, target stimulus. Measures taken uh, were the uh, RT, so reaction times and accuracy scores. And the rationale for using uh, this task was that it's been uh, successfully used in a previous PBM. Uh, experiments which uh, uh, targeted the uh, frontal parietal and uh, the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, um, at last but not least, for what concerns the uh, cognitive tests, the East troop, I guess you're all uh, familiar more or less with the um, with this, this troop task, um, because uh, it was devised like uh, almost a uh, hundred years ago by John Ridley Stroop in 1935, and it consists in uh, um, asking your participants to name the color in which color words are written, and it, it's considered to be a measure of, uh, especially when uh, the participants need to uh, to name the color of uh, congruent color words, a measure of uh, um, cognitive interference and cognitive control. In the uh, in its digital version, this group, um, we need to say that this uh, version was uh, uh, devised uh, was developed by Brunetti and co-workers at um, Università Europea of Rome, and it features four categories of stimuli: geometrical shapes, which act as a as a baseline, neutral words, uh, congruent and incongruent color words. We have different uh, colors in which they are uh, displayed. So it can be uh, red, blue, green, and yellow, as you can see also from the image. And uh, measures taken were, again, uh, the reaction times and uh, the accuracy score. And the rationale for using this test was that uh, uh, this one as well has uh, been uh, used in, uh, in another, uh, at least another, uh, PBM uh, um, experiment uh, successfully, and that uh, 
in that uh, experiment as well, uh, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex was uh, targeted by the stimulation. So now I am done and I pass the ball uh, over to uh, Natalia. So I need to uh, basically um, unshare my presentation. Let me... Okay. Over to you, Natalia. Can you all say it right? Yes. Okay. Yep. So prior prior to testing the results of the main variables, we have run an analysis to explore the demographics between both groups. So a between group check in terms of the age, the sleep, the coffee intake, and years of education as possible confounding uh, factors was performed. Uh, the results show no significant difference between uh, the two groups, the two experimental groups, uh, the one with the um, FNIRS on and the one with the FNIRS off. In the DMS, uh, for each participant and session, uh, pre and post, two outcomes measure were considered. One is the accuracy score and the other one the reaction time score. In the accuracy score, uh, this was given by the sum of the correct responses divided by the total number of the responses. And for the reaction time score, we obtained it by the average of the reaction time. Uh, relative to the correct responses. That means that wrong or incorrect responses were not considered as they would have altered the reliability of the reaction time scores. For instance, by dragging down the average uh, value with very fast but wrong uh, responses at the end. So no, apart from these ones, no other that one was this car. For the BCT, again, two outcome measures were considered, same names accuracy score and response times score. The difference here is that for the accuracy score, we um, uh, we calculated by the sum of the correct responses. So its number correctly identified was counted as a correct response. And this was divided by the total number of responses. For example, total numbers to be identified. And the reaction times in this case um, corresponded to the total time taken to complete the whole counting, for example, to read zero. For the DMS, no difference were found between uh, groups or sessions. Whereas for the VCT, we found a better performance during the post-session in both groups, which was accompanied by less time needed to complete the post-session. To the right, you can appreciate individual responses for each participant per group. And in this gray shadow that you can appreciate in each group are the average uh, of the responses for each of the participants in each of experimental condition. It is therefore plausible that given the involvement of the prefrontal cortex in a BCT task and the location of ethnirs, which at the end of the day is in the frontal lobe, the near infrared light in these experiments produce faster response times compared to those in the experimental group. It is true that in our study, we found an absence of differences in the DMS. However, with a close look to the results, uh, we have seen improvement in response times uh, from the experimental group in the DMS task. It, it is written in the paper. In the experimental group, uh, they read 10.7%, uh, which was more than twice that of the control group, which was in 4.6%. However, neither the accuracy nor response times results achieve um, results in this um, the statistical significance that um, we were expecting. In contrast to two other studies in which they used the same task and a single photobiomodulation treatment. A potential explanation for such inconsistency may lie in the fact that this study had a, a smaller number of participants. Our study has 30, and in the other two that uh, we reported in the paper, they uh, use 40 and 60 respectively. So may have lack sufficient power to detect an effect. Furthermore, uh, both studies found that DMS accuracy declined in the control group in the post-stimulation session, while our control group show an improvement. 
it may also be that rather than enhancing the performance, photobiomodulation makes cognitive tasks less demanding in terms of neural resources. Indeed, a significant reduction in frontal hemodynamic levels following photobiomodulation treatment has been identified when um, participants were performing an impact task. Um, and this is like the DMS at the end of the day is testing the working memory, suggesting then that photobiomodulation could make the task less effortful when high memory loads um, are involved in this task. When we examined the results coming from the ES group in the reaction times, um, taking into account the data gathered in the baseline condition, which is the graph you can see on the left, we have found differences between experimental groups within the post section, where the experimental group performed faster uh, than the control, uh, which is the line um, in dark compared to the green line, and also differences were found within the control groups pre and post session, uh, with a significant worsening of the performance in the post session. For what concerns to the neutral condition, which is the graph you can see in the center of this uh, slide, we found faster reaction times during the possession in the experimental group, whereas the control group did not show any reduction of its reaction times in the possession compared to the pre-session. Uh, furthermore, a significant difference between the possession of the two groups was also highlighted. Um, for the congruent condition, the reaction time uh, from the post session was being significantly reduced compared to those measured during per session in the experimental group. And the same difference as we have described for the neutral condition have been found for the, um, for the, control, for the control group. Moreover, uh, we have found significant differences in the incongruent condition, with the experimental group doing overall better than the control in terms of accuracy. The incongruent condition is still renowned to be the most challenging with respect to the other conditions, having typically longer reaction times compared to the others. This could explain why, in our study, the effect of the stimulation on the performance was less clear during the incongruent condition, at least for what concerned the reaction times. It is known that the prefrontal cortex uh, plays a significant role during both congruent and incongruent trials of the uh, Stroop uh, task. So given its location, again, in the frontal lobes, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex might be the key neural region that our near-infrared uh, light stimulation could stimulate, and its involvement may be responsible for the better performance that we have found at the uh, Stroop task. Comparing the effects of the stimulation using our experiment on the Stroop task with findings from other studies have been quite a challenge, as there are no current um, examples in the photobiomodulation literature of the Stroop task being used to test enhanced cognitive functions in healthy adults. However, uh, we have found two, uh, well, three studies, but two, two of them that have been used participants with traumatic brain injury. Those are coming from the group of NICER, one in 2011, the other one in 2014. In the first one, um, those participants with traumatic brain injury uh, um, uh, and the, the, there are two participants and the second study, the one in 2014, those um, are 11 participants. It, it belongs to a pilot study with chronic traumatic brain injury. And both the studies suggest that repeated photobiomodulation treatment can improve executive function as measured by the Stroop test. However, no improvement in Stroop test performance was found in the paper from Martin and collaborators in 2021 when they were uh, testing participants with illnesses for, uh, from the war. So our results um, raise some questions about the differential effect of near infrared light stimulation based on the type of task presented to the subjects. In this respect, it was Enrique, Jeppert, and collaborators in 2014, uh, the ones who proposed that tasks which uh, are supposed to reflect cognitive control should be differentiated between the measuring 
um, proactive control from those who are measuring, uh, which are measuring the reactive control processes. And this, this distinction between proactive and reactive uh, finds a physiological basis in the different topographic distribution of theta oscillations uh, when, when it's linked to cognitive control. So mainly proactive control recruiting tasks, like for example, in our case, the GMS, would show a focal frontal distribution. Whereas for primary reactive uh, control recruiting tasks, like the stroke, for example, the topographical distribution of theta oscillation would be much broader. Hence, it is no surprise, if we take this result into consideration, that the same intervention in our case is the induction of photobiomodulation through FNIS may affect distinct aspects of the executive functioning as measured by our distinct tests in a different manner. Another important point that should be approached in this talk is related to the power of the application of different wavelengths alone or combined. Indeed, we have plenty of, of, of studies showing that near infrared light application at a specific wavelengths has potentially remarkable protective abilities against mitochondrial dysfunction and neuronal cell death. And we have seen that across so many disorders like Parkinson, Alzheimer's, and so on. But we also are seeing a few studies which have, have proved that combined wavelengths um, could have a superior outcome. In this regard, uh, Mendes et al. Um, in 2003 compared histologically the effect of using two different wavelengths at uh, 685 and 830. They concluded that um, better results were observed when combining both wavelengths and attributed this advantage to different absorption and penetration. The first image from the left show a control experiment seven days after surgery where the distribution of collagen fibers is still immature. However, the combination of both show the presence of bundles of collagen fibers evenly distributed within the um, wounded site. Also, Sir and collaborators in 2019, which is the graph we can see um, at the right, explore the influence of combined and or single application of red and near infrared uh, photobiomodulation at different wavelengths, um, 630 and 8, um, 80, 810. Um, and they apply this once or two times or in combination. And they did that on mesenchymal stem cells and also human uh, adipose stem cells. Their results show that the photobiomodulation with the combined 630 plus 8 10 nanometers laser show better results than, as, than, for example, a single dose, even when administered repeatedly. Another relevant concept is that similar outcomes can be achieved using different devices and wavelengths. We have a sample from the 600 nanometer range uh, going through the 800, the 1000, even some uh, a couple of students in uh, 1200. And only by adjusting light stimulation duration or light emission powers, we can see difference in the outcomes or exactly the same outcomes. It is also worth noting that near infrared light could increase the release of nitrate oxide. And this we know is responsible for this increased cerebral blood flow. Um, how? This is a signaling molecule and can trigger vasodilation. And vasodilation could also improve cognition because it increases the circulation. Um, that is going to improve the oxygenation of the, the brain, brain tissue. Um, and this has also been observed when we apply different sources of energy, for example, the magnetism. So in conclusion, uh, the results we just saw you from the current study provide this support to the hypothesis that the use of a FNIRS device uh, may induce photobiomodulation related processes and therefore have an effect on cognition. To our knowledge, this is the first study using a FNIRS device to induce photobiomodulation and considering our limited sample size, Further evidence is needed to confirm such hypothesis. Nonetheless, the present uh, um, results uh, may have a significant impact on the way FNIRs are conceived and consequently serve as uh, perhaps a wake up call for the scientific community. Um, what we are pretending with this um, study and also with this talk 
is that all future neuroscientific studies using this technology may need to consider the modulatory effects intrinsic in the usage of FNEOS when assessing exactly the, the efficacy or effects of a possible intervention on brain activation and related cognitive performance. Finally, as you all know, um, nothing of significance is uh, ever accomplished alone, as it stands in my lab, which means that we uh, not only need to mention the members of my group and the funding bodies, but also Mateo and many other institutes, colleagues, collaborators, patients, families, and voluntary subjects that have contributed to this and the upcoming studies. So thank you all for your attendance and for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia and Matteo. I mean, this is uh, very intriguing. Uh, and uh, maybe you can uh, um, and share so we can see uh, what questions they are. Um, while you are doing so, I was wondering about uh, if you wanted to comment a little on the parameters. Uh, um, so, the, for instance, if you know the total surface uh, area, of irradiation and uh, the irradiation or the influence uh, so that we have a kind of a, a sense of uh, the stimulation here. Um, yeah, I think uh, Natalia calculated this in the in the paper because it was something not provided by the Spectra company. Um, actually, when I asked them, uh, the uh, it wasn't clear yeah. to them uh, what yeah, yeah. what that was because probably because of the traditional use of it. I mean, they uh, they were never pushed to think about it. But um, if I remember correctly, I don't know if you remember. I, but, I have it, um... I, I open it, yeah, because it's the yeah, five okay. the five milli, millivolts uh, for the e both for the 717 mm -hmm. nanometers and the same for the 840 nanometers, yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 five milli, uh, milliwatts as I, as I, as we said during the presentation, but the radiation area you also calculated was seven point something joule per square centimeter, something like that. Don't want yeah. to say something uh, not exact, but um, okay. No, I mean if you um, it's, it's, if at any point, I mean if you have it, sorry. you can share it with uh, um, in in the chat. I mean, but hmm. uh, that that gives us a, a ballpark. Uh, um, yeah, no, we were calculating the um, the energy because we, I mean, in in all the well, all all of you that work with photobiomodulation, we need to take account the time, the radiation, the density of the energy. I know sometimes it's happening when we bought this this equipment, and then we were doing the maths. We we work with engineers also to to measure uh, how much is the radiation that also goes through the scalps and through the tissues. Uh, otherwise, we cannot control how much is coming inside. And also, we have noticed when we were working with the lasers, or for you, it should be the same experience, that once we perform the experiments of after a couple of subjects, we need to readjust sometimes the laser because they they, they decline in the amount that they are, they are providing. So we need, again, to... Right, yeah. absolutely. And, and this is the um, emitting sources were lasers or were LEDs? This one, the... These are the lasers, right, Mateo? These are the lasers. Um, in the lab, we are comparing lasers with the, with the LEDs as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions or, or comments. And... I had a uh, Marvin. I don't know if someone see Aura. Um, yeah, I'm turning my camera on now. Uh, but the question was: Was there a, any comment by the participants in terms of physical reactions, like uh, over what, what I would consider overstimulation responses? But certainly um, headache, dizzy irritability, anxiety, anxiousness, or congestion, any of that kind of response, because that would certainly lend itself to an impaired performance. We, we, um, yeah, can I, it, maybe yeah. I can address this one. Um, yes, thanks for the question, uh, Marvin, because uh, then uh, you 
allow me to acknowledge uh, Jason Lee White, which, uh, who was the uh, first author of this, uh, together with Natalia, uh, of this uh, article and uh, who dealt with the, the data collection. So he was the one dealing with the, the participants. Uh, in my experience with this uh, type of device, the only uh, drawback in terms of uh, um, yeah, possible side effects are a, a light headache because uh, you, you have this thing that is, uh, it's very, you know, tight. It's quite tight. If you want to have a good calibration and a good signal, then you have to make sure that uh, no hairs are, are, you know, in the middle, obviously, but also that uh, it's, it sticks, you know, to, to the uh, participant's skin very firmly. So after a while, yes, you can have some some sort of uh, light headache, yes. But apart that from would, that... Uh, yeah, hmm. that would definitely get in the way of my counting backwards from 112. <laughs> but I, I hear you. Uh, so if there was a way to measure without significant pressure on the skull... Yeah, that that would be. We we better. we are we are running those experiments, Marvin. <laughs> we are running those ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have so many questions. The good things about uh, experiments is that they are opening uh, new. You you close a window, you open a new door. Exactly. So we are trying that in in different ways, and we are also designing the. Um, the, the dispositives uh, by ourselves in combination with the uh, an equipment, an yeah. army of engineers. And uh, let's see, let's see what, what those experiments get us. But yeah, oh, and I also wrote on the chat the, the amount of energy we are providing. I see, I see it, thank you. Marnie has a question. There was a question in the chat that says, uh, did you see uh, the influence of, uh, I guess, FNIRS on uh, interference in Stroop task? Um, the okay. effect that we got, uh, as Natalia discussed, um, uh, the effect that we got in the interference was uh, uh, limited to the uh, to the accuracy. Um, yep. So no, not in the reaction times, um, and it was relative to uh, the post sessions of uh, both groups. So we did find something. Uh, but um, contrary to to the other uh, results uh, along the East Troop, it was not related to the uh, reaction times, but uh, to the uh, performance. We need to say uh, we need to be true. Probably uh, our sample was not uh, you know our style was slightly underpowered um, because if we look at the other. Um, transcranial PBM studies, then you usually have uh, 40, well, you, you have different samples to be true, but um, the ones that we um, uh, referred to, uh, some of them use, uh, use a bigger sample. So it might be that um, we could have found more if we had more, more participants probably. So, uh, Matteo and Natalia, we have uh, two questions, uh, really quick questions, uh, Marnie and Jeff, uh, um, and quick answers so, so we can make it. Okay, I will be very fast. Um, I wanted to share screen, but I guess we don't have time. I wanted to comment that our um, subjects in our um, study, where you did not see this improvement in the Stroop, uh, yeah. were, were not, as you said correctly, they were not traumatic brain injury cases, but they were very, very, very different. They were Gulf War illness, which is exposure of the soldiers in um, Kuwait in 1990, 91 to burn pits. There was a lot of chemical damage to the brain. Um, also, they were taking uh, uh, anti-nerve gas pills, which also damaged the mitochondria in the brain and the muscles. So I wanted to make sure that people understand this is a completely different subject population. And if I had time, I would show you the slides because we also um, made a big mistake by using a green goggle, uh, green tinted goggles, for the real and the sham participants. So actually, 
everybody um, improved, uh, real or sham, uh, even on the Stroop, um, the trial three, uh, if they uh, <laughs> had participated, period, because green wavelengths going into the brain will have a beneficial effect on the brain function. That was at the one week testing. And then at the one month testing, those who got the real um, PBM continued to improve, but those who got the sham went back to baseline. Yeah. So the green goggles did not have a long-term effect, but the near-infrared wavelengths of light did. So I'd be glad to show the slide sometime if we had time. Thank you, Thank you just on that. Oh, and my last name is Naser. It's pronounced Naser. like Naser. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, Maybe. thank you so much. I'm terrible from trying to pronounce the uh, surname. Oh, it's very everywhere. difficult. Sorry. Everybody does it. It seems just easier. <laughs> I don't know why it's German. <laughs> Thank you, Marnie. Jeff, uh, your last comment, uh, one minute. Thanks, Paula. Mine, mine is um, is a comment and then a question. Um, this uh, seems to fit into the area of science, looking at the reactivity of phenomena to being measured. And this, you know, goes across areas of science, you know, the concern about that. Um, and what I was wondering about was, given that you found this, and I think it's important to do these kind of parametric studies, what do we do about it? Is there a um, correction factor that needs to be added into studies? Do we throw out the measurement method? Um, in other words, it's there. And to just say, hmm, okay, look at this. And we need to study it more, look at it more. It's like toward what end? I mean, what do we want to do with it? And it seems like if it's some kind of identifiable constant or something that we can work with, then identify that and figure out how to incorporate it into the analyses or some, some way to account for it. Thank you. Really true. Yeah. I mean, in terms, we have, Mateo and myself, we have discussed that uh, moving forward, obviously. Uh, one for the experimental settings is just to add a control group in which you also uh, take into account that those cognitive uh, tests uh, should be done with this control only with the FNIS. We, we cannot and uh, we cannot allow to, to, to trash all these data that we have. And in worst case scenario, what we are doing is improving the condition of the people in which we are taking uh, these measurements. So there is no no such a, a worsening or a secondary effect that is harming in, in, at any point. But certainly to try. But the problem is that this correction, fact, uh, this correction factor, uh, we should also discuss um, what are we improving? Because if we follow the, the, the current rationale, which is that we are improving all the ne neurons that needs to uh, be supported, uh, the ones that are in need and so on, you cannot find that correction factor for everybody. Uh, it will have a, a specific subpopulation that needs this assistance and other will have in a different brain region. So perhaps depending on where you're taking the measurements, you will see the difference. So until we have a clear idea about the mechanisms that are behind or the population in the brain that is taking advantage of this photobiomodulation, I think it's hard for us to, this, to, to delineate this correction factor. But um, I don't know which are your opinions in, in regards to this. Thank you all. I know we are out of time and next time we'll uh, try to address more the questions also in the chat. Um, thanks so much, uh, uh, Natalia and Matteo for being here today. And uh, all of you for this uh, interesting discussion. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.